one of the big concepts involved in this lab is the fact that we'll be going between two different uh, coordinate systems. We'll be representing complex numbers using Cartesian coordinates and then with polar coordinates. I also should say that my connection has been somewhat unstable. So if I cut out and you miss something, just let me know and I'll be happy to repeat it. So we have two different coordinate systems, Cartesian coordinates and then polar coordinates. The first one is probably the one you're more familiar with. If you have a complex number that's, let's say, x plus yi, it's two real numbers, a real number x and then a real number y, with the difference between them being is that the second one is paired with an i. So they're not like terms, they're different. You can't combine them, meaning they're sort of two separate components. We graph that in a plane, thinking of the horizontal axis as being the real axis and the vertical axis as being the imaginary axis, or at least in this case. And we can imagine there being, let's say, an x value here, and then a y value here. And then when we match this up, just as if we would have plotted an, a point x, y, here we have z is equal to x plus y times i. Excuse me. Now, you can convert from Cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates and vice versa. And that's what we'll do here, is we'll imagine this point, uh, x plus y, i, as giving us a right triangle in the plane, like so. Actually, I can do better than that. So it has the hypotenuse, and then it has these two sides, and this is a right triangle. The side here is the hypotenuse of this right triangle, and it's that hypotenuse that we think of over here in the polar coordinate system as being the modulus. One way to represent that modulus is by saying this is the absolute value of whatever your complex number is named. We're naming it z for the moment. So we'll say absolute value of z. That absolute value of z is this length here. That's going to be the modulus. I've drawn it a little strangely to sort of evoke this notion that as the modulus uh, gets larger, it sort of pushes the point away from the origin. If we imagine over on the uh, left here, a different complex number, let's say that complex number was here, it would have a different modulus. Let's maybe draw a little more straight like that. Okay, I got this. All right, there we go. This point that I've drawn here is farther away from the origin than this point. So naturally, we'd expect that the modulus is larger. So if maybe I call this point z prime, then z prime has a larger modulus than just z. Besides the modulus, how far are you away from the origin? You also want to know what the angle is. So for instance, I could over on the uh, left here graph a point that roughly maybe looks like this. And I've tried to draw it, so that, draw it so that the modulus looks to be the same between these two. It looks like this is the same distance from the origin as this one. So the modulus is not enough to specify what the point is. Besides the modulus, one also needs to know what the angle is. And though this and this are the same distance, or supposed to be, same distance from the origin, they're at totally different angles. One is at an angle that looks like a roughly 45 degrees, or pi over 4 radians, and the other one looks like it's roughly 3 pi over 4 radians. So they're different angles. In order to represent the angle, that's where color is going to come in. So over here, if you had a point, you could think of that point as sitting somewhere inside this color wheel that we have here. For instance, if you had, let's say, this point, and just for kind of visual reference, might look like, like that. We have an angle 
that corresponds to this angle, where as we move up off of the horizontal axis on the right, we start to increase from zero and so on. So right now, this has an angle of roughly pi over four. If we were to go over to here, this would have an angle of pi over two. If we were to go here, this would have an angle of pi, three pi over two, and then finally back to close to two pi. In order to represent that angle, what we'll do is we'll use color. So this particular point, since it's at an angle of roughly 45 degrees or pi over four radians, we would color this angle, or sorry, color this point um, blue. So what you could do is alternatively represent this or represent a point on a axis that corresponds, and how do I want to put this? So let's do this. Let me uh, set it up like so. So you could imagine having a modulus axis, and then you could have a color that you plot. So maybe if we had this point here that's green, and it's at a distance, I don't know, just for example, let's say it's at a distance three from the origin. What this would correspond to, this point that I've just drawn right here, that would correspond to a point alternatively that might be somewhere over here. And where this is distance three from the origin. So there's different ways to represent uh, complex numbers. You can do it using Cartesian coordinates here, which I think is the way we're usually introduced to them. You can represent it using polar coordinates, where you have a distance from the origin being the modulus, and then you have an angle. And I've written spatial here, and I realize that that is a mistake, so let me change that. It's not a spatial thing, it's a color thing. And you can sort of furthermore represent it, like this, this tells you what the angle should be based or what the color should be based on the angle. And then this is just another way to represent it more in line with what we'll look at shortly, where you have a height being the modulus and then you have the color being the angle. Okay, so the big thing to keep in mind, two different ways of representing a complex number. A uh, two spatial coordinates, Cartesian coordinates, or a modulus, which is a spatial coordinate, and then a color uh, for the argument or the angle which is, of course, non-spatial. All right. Now, all of this is to build up to the notion of a complex function. So what we have is, actually, let me divide this up a little bit, make it a little, just a little easier to read. So let's put this here. Let's move these up. Let us slightly modify this for reasons that will become clear soon. I'll put a zero here. Move this up, this up. And let's divide this out a little bit. And then let's put this here. OK, good. That'll work. Now, here's what we'll do is we'll imagine, because the whole point of this lab is to look at uh, complex functions and um, functions from complex numbers to complex numbers, and just kind of study their behavior. So we want to say, in order to do that, we'll start with numbers uh, that are written in Cartesian coordinates. So we'll think of complex numbers as having an, you know, an X component and then a Y component or two just Cartesian components. And we'll graph them in a plane that we think of as lying flat. And based on what I had just seen from last time, I'm gonna shift this slightly so that it's more in line with what we will see in the applet. Uh, so let me just do a slight adjustment. So 
so that it lines up with what we see in the applet. Okay. All right, there we go. Their axes were just a little different than I had drawn. Okay, so we have a, a domain that is points that start out here. And what we're going to do is we're going to map them via some map to uh, other points in the complex plane. Just as an example, before we explain each of these parts individually, what we might do is start with a point Z that is equal to, let's say, 1 plus 2i. And then we have a function, let's say f, that maps the complex numbers to the complex numbers. And what it does is it takes a complex number z and it sends it to, let's say, z squared, which would also be a complex number. And we like to essentially think about how that graph looks. And in order to just represent that graph, we need to make sure we understand what's going on here. Where what we do to start with is we have a point that's in the domain, or you know there are a variety of points, but just we'll focus on one to begin with. If we use this particular example of one plus two i, for instance, we have one for the x component, and then one, two for the y component. And if we graph this in this, what looks like kind of a, a plane that's lying flat, we've got this point here, and this is our z, is equal to one plus two i. So notice the one hash mark along the x-axis and the two hash marks along the uh, y-axis. Or said another way, we have the real axis and then we have the imaginary axis. Actually, let me even just clean it up and say the real x and imaginary, just like the y. Okay, good. Now what we do is we send this to a point, and that point is going to have a, or a point, a complex number, and that complex number is going to have a height or modulus, and then a angle or color. We can do a particular computation here, and if we take z, which is 1 plus 2i in this particular case, and we square it, we can just find out what that gives us. So we get what? Uh, z or 1 plus 2i gets mapped to, so this little arrow with the, sort of the uh, bar on the left here, that represents maps to, one point maps to another, and it maps to 1 plus 2i times 1 plus 2i. And these are just both binomials, nothing fancy going on. We can simply just FOIL them, first outside, inside, last. The first is going to give us 1. The outside inside is going to give us 2i and then another 2i, so 4i. And then the last will give us negative 4 because we have 2i times 2i, which is 4i squared. i squared is uh, negative 1. In total, that gives us negative 3 plus 4i. Now, we want to represent this in terms of having a modulus and having an angle, or in this case, a height and a color. The modulus is going to be relatively easy to compute here. We can imagine, like before, this giving us a right triangle. Actually, I can draw that a little nicer. This is a right triangle. The side isn't going to be negative in length, but just to kind of give the idea that we have negative 3 is the uh, one coordinate, and then 4 is the other coordinate. But if we think of these in terms of having absolute value for the lengths, we can find out the modulus, which is this here. And maybe I should back up and say, where do I get this from? I get this from thinking of this point being in the uh, complex plane, which would kind of look something like this, where we have the imaginary axis and the real axis. And now in order to find this modulus, we can just use a little bit of uh, 
just basic geometry, namely the Pythagorean theorem. So actually, I'm going to get rid of some of this just to declutter it. And here we have that if this is h, h squared is equal to 3 squared plus 4 squared, which is equal to 25. And then, of course, that means that h is equal to 5. That means the modulus of this complex number, negative 3 plus 4i, is 5. It has a distance 5 from the origin. And we represent that by the height. So we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now, I'm not going to put a point there yet because I want to know what color it should be. In order to find out what color it should be, we want to plot the point in the complex plane, but where we have color added. So here's the real axis. Here's the imaginary axis. And let's give this some color. Uh, let's see, green is kind of over here. We have this here and so on. So I'm just trying to recreate the color wheel real quick. And there it is. Okay. So with this quick recreation of the color wheel, we can think about the point negative 3, 4. So negative 3 is going to go 1, 2, 3, back this way. And then it's going to go up 1, 2, 3, 4. Very roughly, that looks like it puts it in the magenta field of the color wheel here. Yeah, someone just mentioned, uh, I keep cutting out a lot. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I, unfortunately, I don't have any control over it. It's just bad internet. Um, so if, if you miss something, I'm happy to go back because I'm aware it's happening. It's just that I, I can't really tell when it happens. Occasionally, Zoom will just say your internet connection is unstable, but I think that's usually after, after I've already cut out for people. So again, if, if you miss something, uh, please just feel free to ask me. So let's see. Uh, until then, what we have is, in this case, magenta for the color. The reason being is we plotted the point, but with colors, uh, we keep... we. Uh, we place the color wheel in the normal complex plane, and we just see where does that point lie in that color wheel. And in this particular case, it looks like it's magenta, or in the magenta area. So what we would do is we would say, at the height of 5, we would put, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, we would put this point in magenta. So there are two components here. There's the component of height, which corresponds to the modulus that we computed down here. And then the second thing is the color, which corresponds to the angle, which we found right here. Now we put these things together. Notice we plotted a point in the domain where we laid the plane flat. And then we have this axis here where we have a height, that is how far is it away from the origin, and then we have a color, which is what's the angle? Where is it located along the color wheel when we apply the color wheel to the complex plane? And now what we do then is we say, looking at the flat, like we notice we have these axes here and here that corresponds to the axis here and here. If we look at the point 1 plus 2i, so we go 1 and then 2. And that gives us a spot roughly about here. I'm going to try not to clutter it too much, but give us an idea where that should be. Then we go ahead and we uh, plot the height. The height is going to be 5, so we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And now at this point, if you've done Calc 3, this is just like Calc 3. We sort of graph this three-dimensional box, and then we would plot a point here. Now the plot I should point, or the point I should plot there, uh, should have the right color. So that's why I'm going to put a magenta point there. So we see it has a height. We see that it has a color. And then it has a location above the xy plane. So that location is important. We could have a different point 
uh, somewhere, let's say over here, and it maps, let's say, to a height like this, and then, I don't know, maybe the color is green or something like this. And then because we now have all the dimensions represented, what we will get is a, is a graph. And now before going on, I want to open it up to questions you have. If you have any questions at this point, it's better to ask it now than, than later. Uh, I mean, you can ask it later. I won't stop you. That's okay. But it's, if we can clear things up now, that would be a more ideal thing. If you, if you even know what questions to formulate, uh, sometimes it can just be a lot to take in, so you're not really even sure what to ask. That's okay too, but any questions you have now, I'm happy to answer. And I should say questions about uh, this particular material, about complex numbers and so on. So someone asked, is the height the square of Z? So the height is the uh, distance from the origin of the number that you map to. So we start with the number 1 plus 2i. We square that number. And in squaring it, what we get is, uh, you know, 1 plus 2i times 1 plus 2i. We do the computation, and we end up with negative 3 plus 4i. Then we look at how far away from the origin is the complex number negative 3 plus 4i. To find that, we do this little geometric calculation. For instance, uh, if we take z, like for another example, if we take z equals, I don't know, 3 plus 1i, that's going to get mapped to, because we square it, it's going to get mapped to 9 plus 6i minus 1, is that true? Yep, is equal to 8 plus 6i. The distance of the complex number 8 plus 6i from the origin, like if you were to plot it and we get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, then we get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then we look at that distance, we can just use some geometry to find out what that is. It has a base of 8, it has a height of 6. So this is going to be the square root of 36 plus 64. It's going to be 10. Oh, wow. That worked out really well. Oh, crap. Uh, I have to reshare my screen because it cut out for a reason I'm not sure why. Yeah, sorry about that. It... I think after having a long enough time of sharing continuously, uh, it just stops working for some reason. I have to reset it. So I think now you should be able to see what I was writing. So I was talking uh, the whole time, and I think you were not able to see. Uh, but what I was saying was this, this example here, that you could take the complex number 3 plus 1 times i. If you square it, it would map to... 9 plus 6i minus 1, which is 8 plus 6i. And then if you look at the distance of that number, which, or of that yeah, complex number in the plane from the origin, it has a distance 10 from the origin here. So it's distance 10 away from the origin. Just like this number, negative 3 plus 4i, was distance 5 away from the origin. That is what corresponds to the height. So if we were to plot where this number, 3 plus 1i, gets mapped to, and it gets mapped to 8 plus 6i, it would get uh, mapped to a modulus of 10, meaning it would be a height of 10 above the, uh, the xy plane here. So we'll see when we graph these that there are different points of differing heights. Okay, let's, let's take a look at the applet. Maybe I think it'll be helpful to answer that and just get into it. So let's do this. Let's share. Okay. All right, good. Uh, I have to move my face. And I wanted to reset 
What was this? Okay. So here's what we have uh, when we graph the function that is that goes from the complex numbers to the complex numbers, and it takes and squares whatever complex number you start with. So it's an analog of the, the, of the real valued function, which is f of x is equal to x squared. But now we have complex number z. Now what we can do is think of this in the following way. This uh, imz means the imaginary part of the domain complex number. And what, since it's going uh, like this, what that means is that the imaginary axis is actually looking something like so. And the real axis is looking something like so. So the real axis is, hor is the one that's kind of moving horizontally across your screen. And the imaginary axis is the one that looks like it's kind of coming in and out of the screen. So it's like this. What we did as an example is we took the point um, one, two, which roughly might look like, uh, it's I'm kind of gonna be blocked a little bit, but it might be a point kind of around there roughly, depending on the scale, but just to give an idea. Then if we draw upwards, from there, follow that point up, what we showed is that it eventually hit this point where there was um, magenta. And actually, let me do a, there we go. So it kind of went like so. So the point one, two, which is the point that I'm trying to highlight here, this is the point one plus two i, or the complex number one plus two i, that gets mapped to, via the map z goes to z squared, that gets mapped to this complex number, where this complex number is represented by a height, which I've put in white, and then the color, which is the, the angle. So the height is the modulus, or the distance it is from the origin, and then the color is its angle. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to say about that? Um, uh, I think that's all I want to say for the moment. So that's, that's what's going on here. Now you can look at this as uh, a side view, which is what I have, or you can look at it as a top view. I'll just switch to a top view for a second, though it's going to look a little weird with everything I've drawn, but nonetheless. So it's going to look like so. So both of these have their advantages and disadvantages. <clears throat> Excuse me. So feel free to switch between them. The thing is that you can see a little bit more easily what's going on with the angle or the color once you look at a top view, but you essentially lose all sense of the modulus or what the height is. So from the side view, you can actually see the height, but when you take the top view, then all of a sudden you can't see the height anymore. So sometimes it's more useful to use one over the other. Now, one of the first things it asks in the assignment is to look at the following things. It says graph this function. Uh, and actually, let me write it. So it says graph this. Graph, and I apologize for the poor writing. It's kind of hard to control with the mouse. F of x, no, not f of x, f of z is equal to z squared. Not z squared, e to the pi z. I was thinking of the one we were just looking at. All right, good. Now, what it's going to then say is you also want to look at uh, two other functions. Over here on the right, I'm going to actually above, let me write Euler's formula. And I can type some of it. So Euler's formula, what Euler's formula looks like is the following. It is e to the i theta 
is equal to cosine of theta plus I sine of theta. So just as a reminder, that's what Euler's formula is. Uh, there we go. What we're going to look at here is uh, something that might be similar or it might not. We want to look at the function uh, e to the pi z, which I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to graph here. To represent that, we go exp uh, pi z. I'll hit enter. So the graph of this e to the pi z, it's here. So now we see what this looks like. And there are some qualities we might notice. We might notice that uh, as the real part of the domain values get small, uh, more negative, then the modulus certainly decreases. As the real values increase, we notice that the modulus of the codomain values uh, increase. So as you change the real value of the domain complex numbers, as you reduce them, the modulus of the codomain complex numbers gets small, and vice versa. As you increase the domain uh, real values, you increase the modulus of the, uh, of the codomain. And then we also notice some interesting things like, oh, there's kind of a, a periodicity, as it mentions, uh, or a cycle to these numbers. Like it looks like it starts at cyan and it goes through to cyan and it, it looks like it kind of goes through the different angles as you just, let's say, fix a, a real, real value uh, in the domain and you just uh, change the imaginary value. So as you go from, let's say, something like uh, what does that look like? Negative one plus two i, and then you change that to negative one, or actually not, yeah, negative one plus three halves i, and so on. And you constantly just like fix your real value and just change the imaginary value. we notice what happens is that it keeps the same modulus. That is, the height doesn't change, for instance, when we're again looking along, along this. The height doesn't change, but the, the uh, angle cycles through, and it looks like it completely goes from where it starts at cyan here, and then it ends back at cyan here, which is kind of interesting. So that's one thing just to note. Uh, and someone said, this reminds me of cylindrical chords. Is this kind of the same thought process? Actually, I'm not sure. What, what are cylindrical chords offhand? That sounds familiar, but I can't remember. If, if you remind me what that is, I can, I can try to make the connection. So yeah, it could be something to do with cylindrical chords. I just can't remember what that is offhand. But yeah, if you explain, I, I can certainly look or like try to remember. So we've got this function. Now, how this matches up with Euler's formula is the following. If we then look at two other functions, we want to see if there's a relationship. Notice this is i theta up here. And then we have theta, we have theta, and then we have i out front. So that's from Euler's formula. A version of that, if you try to kind of get this to fit this, would be the following is there could be two other functions. G of Z is equal to uh, cosine pi Z divided by I, and then H of Z is equal to i sine. Now, where am I coming up with these? I'm coming up with these by trying to fit the pattern laid out 
here in Euler's formula. So notice that here is I theta. Actually, let me put that in a different color to highlight it more. Here's I theta, but then here's theta. Likewise, here we have pi z, and you'll notice the difference between I theta and theta up top here is that theta in this case is divided by I. So we have I theta divided by I gives us regular theta. Likewise, if we take this thing, pi z, in order to get what should be here, we just divide by I. And it works exactly the same in the other case. Notice this function here is I. Actually, let me sort of do some difference in colors. Um, let's do green. And it's, it's not corresponding to like the, the stuff over here. It's just uh, to make it easier to track. There's this. And then maybe finally I'll do, actually not finally, we got two more. Got the I here. And then maybe I'll do orange is here. Okay. So we see how it's really similar that if you take the green thing, which is I theta, you divide it by I, you get this thing and this thing. So too, do we take this green thing and we get, uh, when we divide by I, we get this and this. And likewise, we still have a one out front or an I out front here and we have an I out front here. And to go back to a question someone asked about the uh, cylindrical coordinates. Oh, yes. Uh, it's very much like that. Yep. Yeah, in fact, it's identical to that with one exception. Uh, the one exception being that there's the additional color. So the color adds another dimension to it. But if you sort of stripped all the color away, you would essentially be back to uh, cylindrical or no, is that actually right? No, that's not quite right. Uh, but it's, it's worth maybe mentioning a little bit. So in our case, we go x, y gets sent to essentially r, how do I write it, theta? So that's what we're doing here. With cylindrical coordinates, what you have is r, theta z. So you start with uh, kind of polar coordinates to begin with, and then you have um, an additional height. Like there's, there's, some, there's similarity in the sense that when we map in the codomain to r theta, it matches up like with the r theta we had back here, you know, but they're kind of in different places. In our case, we're sending to an R theta. In the other case, that's kind of what we started with, an R and theta. But I mean, it is true that we are involving polar coordinates in each case. So that what you can remember about polar coordinates, that is still helpful, for sure. And especially because we're using polar coordinates and interacting with uh, like Cartesian coordinates beyond that. So it's, it is a mix of Cartesian and polar coordinates. So that's, that's certainly true. So there's some relationship, but maybe not, not uh, directly exactly the same, just because of how we're choosing to graph either one. Though we will see some, I guess you could argue, cylindrical type behavior in some ways when we look at poles and so on. OK. Now, what, what is the point of number one and really two and three here? The point is to look at the graphs of each of these. So look at the graph of this, which we are looking at right now. Then also look at the graph of this, and then look at the graph of this, and see how they compare. For instance, if we do the graph of, and actually I need to erase this because this will no longer be true. If we look at the graph of cosine 
pi z divided by i. Hit enter. Take a second, we get this thing here. And then likewise, if we also do i sine, hit enter, I think we'll see a similar shape, but different coloring. Yeah, oh, actually that's very interesting because it looked like the right side did not change. Looked like um, everything over here stayed the same and it's just the left side that changed. Anyways, what you wanna do is kind of investigate that more and try to argue why it might be the case that this function is just a sum, quote unquote, of these two functions. And then there'll be analogous questions for things like hyperbolic cosine and sine, and a few other things. You'll be asked, how are the graphs related uh, in various ways? And that's one, two, and three, essentially. What I want to mention, while we still have a few minutes, is the following thing. You're going to get to a point where it's asking you about zeros and poles. So I want to say something about that. And in order to do that, I need to annotate. Let's clear all this. So there's something called zeros or roots. Oh, actually I can just type this. Zeros, which are roots, and then uh, poles. And to give examples of each, if you have a, let's say a function that is f of z, is equal to z squared plus one. There are two roots to this function, or two zeros, two places where, or two complex numbers where you, excuse me, you can substitute in uh, a complex number and you can get zero, namely i and uh, negative i. Correspondingly, so let me just put those, z is i and negative i. Correspondingly, there are poles such as, let's say, f of z is equal to 1 over z squared plus 1. There are places where if you substitute in a number, what you get out is, um, ooh, it's looking a little rough, but we'll go with it, uh, where you get an undefined result. In the first case, if we do f of z is z squared plus 1, and we plot this, and enter, it looks like this. And if we look at a top view, a kind of interesting thing happens. We notice there's two kind of interesting points where what we get is this kind of cycling through of the different colors. And then notice if we do the same thing, but for one divided by this, now, I and negative I will become poles. They'll become poles because when you substitute it into this function, it gives an undefined result. And now we notice this interesting thing happens. So I won't say too much more. I'm sure you already recognize some kind of pattern between the two, but that's gonna be what it's asking you about later is roots and poles. And I just wanted to kind of highlight that so you, you had a little bit of idea going into it what was going on. All right, and with that, uh, I hope you have a good day, and we'll talk to you later. To view the next video in this series, click the link on the right. To view the last video in this series, click the link on the left. If you want to learn more about me, the nerd who's making these videos, visit the website below. And as always, have a good day.